welcome to Elder Help's webinar. Um, we are excited to be here with our guest speaker, Dr. Casciani, and I will be introducing him in just a moment. Our webinar today will be on the topic of aging well with resilience, and I think we'll learn a lot um, as we go through the next hour. My name is Carrie McClellan. I'm the Outreach Manager for Elder Health, and I have the pleasure of facilitating webinars like these to bring different topics to the community. I want to first do a special thank you to Pharma, who has sponsored today's webinar, and I will be including information about what they do in the follow-up email that you receive after the webinar. So um, keep an eye out for that so that you can learn more about the wonderful work that they are doing. Our mission at Elder Help is to provide services and information to help older adults continue aging in place successfully and with dignity in their own homes. So today's topic is definitely relevant for a lot of our clients and volunteers and community members who might be um, represented in the audience today. We have been supporting the San Diego community for over 48 years now. Just to give you a brief idea of what services we provide, we offer information and referral to not only seniors, but also family members or anybody who is looking for resources. We're fortunate in San Diego to have a variety of resources available, but sometimes it's a matter of knowing what they are and how to access them. And we are available to help out with that process. We offer different check-in calls to seniors who are looking for that. Uh, one of our programs is called Are You OK? And that is available Monday through Friday for check-ins just to make sure that they're doing all right. We offer transportation through our Seniors A Go Go program. Our care coordination program offers social work support as well as a variety of services through volunteers. And Volunteers are really at the core of our organization, helping our clients to be able to age in place successfully. Our housing services team works to help individuals find affordable housing options. We support a couple of senior buildings in the county, and we have a very unique program called Home Share, which is essentially a, a roommate matching or a housemate matching service. And this webinar today comes through our Family Caregiver Support Program. Although the topic is definitely relevant for anybody who is looking for education and, and resources and learning. Um, but through our Family Caregiver Support, we provide a variety of topics through our webinars on an almost monthly basis. And you can find a library of our previously recorded webinars on our website, elderhelpofsandiego.org. On our family caregiver page, you can access that. We've also developed online courses that are available for anybody who's interested in learning more. We have helpful assessment tools and education through those courses as well. And they can also be accessed through our family caregiver page. Uh, we have a partnership with Alzheimer's San Diego as well as Southern Caregiver Resource Center. So together we're collectively reaching more family caregivers in our community to offer that support. So it is definitely a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. Casciani, and I'm just going to share a little bit about him before I let him take the reins. Um, so Dr. Casciani has a 35-year history in aging as a psychologist and manager of mental health practices. He was awarded the first contracts from the California Department of Aging in 1982 to develop mental health training for the state's nursing homes. For 16 years, he was the clinical lead for a multi-state group practice for patients in nursing homes. He later ran his own company, Concept Healthcare, for eight years in two states with the same goals. In 2018, he extended his professional interest in aging to his new venture, the Living to 100 Club. The website, livingto100.club, offers a collection of strategies and resources on successful aging and his weekly podcasts on aging and longevity continue in this tradition with guests who share their professional insights about aging well and making the most of our senior years. He is now a clinical consultant, public speaker, and offers one-on-one -on -one counseling and coaching with older adults. 
And I definitely think we'll learn a lot from Dr. Casciani over the next hour. So we look forward to um, hearing his topic and we are grateful to have you joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you and congratulations to you and the Elder Help Organization for all the good work that you're doing. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and give you the reins. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for tuning in. You've, you've uh, turned, tuned in today to hear my strategies for aging well with resilience. I'm sure most of our audience has heard a lot of the strategies for living longer and staying healthy as we age, things like diet and fitness and exercise and family connections, social support. We know a lot about improving the odds of living longer and healthier, but what happens when we hit those setbacks? What happens when we have a, you know, a hurdle that comes along? We know it's not a smooth road for everyone. We know there's gonna be potholes. And how do we manage those setbacks? That's what I'm gonna share with you today. I wanna share some ideas about how to handle those obstacles that come along with our advancing years. And maybe we can look forward to getting older no matter what gets in the way. We'll talk about our mental attitude and outlook, thinking styles, managing depression, and starting new chapters. And when we're finished, I hope you have a fresh new mindset about our senior years. There are so many positive opportunities out there to enjoy. I hope you'll feel energized and excited about your future with new strategies to handling the bumps that come along. Imagine how you'll feel in a week or a month or a year with some of these tools at your fingertips. Quickly, my personal story, uh, Carrie touched on it in, in her very nice introduction of me, but I worked in nursing homes for many years, um, doing a lot of administrative work, but also doing clinical work. And I worked with families and patients and, and staff, and I learned so many things. And I wanna share with you three lessons that I learned that I took away and have you know left a lasting impression on me first of all i i'm always concerned about how some people can adapt to a physical event a medical event like a fall or a, a stroke they can engage in their rehabilitation and push hard and, and progress and others in the same situation say i don't think i can handle this i don't think i can handle any more hits like this you know, kind of the final straw, they, you know, throw their hands up and say, I'm finished. So I, I was, you know, concerned about what's the difference between these two groups and their outlooks. Second um, lesson I've learned is that the body doesn't always cooperate. If there's any golfers in the audience, you'll know what I'm talking about. But seriously, um, we still have our mind, no matter what's going on with our body, we have an amputation. We have kidney dialysis. Um, we have uh, reliance on a wheelchair. Um, we can't walk. Whatever's going on, we still have the I in there, the me in there that can you know, frame our thinking and can frame our attitudes about the body, even though the body doesn't cooperate. So it allows us to get up each day with a smile on our face, regardless of what's going on with the body. The third lesson that I learned is that there's a bottomless reserve of determination or grit or resilience or whatever we want to call it. Each of us has this. And if we dig deep, it's it's there. Sometimes it's, we feel like it's gone or it's blocked or you know covered up and we don't feel like there's any determination left. But my belief and my experience is that we always have that that fire or flame. And that's the that's the spirit that allows us to push through these tough spots. So I'll talk more about that as I progress through my talk today. So I started the, the Living to 100 Club to collect these insights and, and share with others. So let's get started with my strategies. Uh, let's try this one. Okay. So we're talking today about living to 100. To me, this is a metaphor that represents our attitudes about getting older, what we tell ourselves, and how we cope with stressful events. So to me, successful aging is more than a destination or goal. It's the result of making the right choices, having the right mindset, having the right outlook, and keep moving forward no matter what gets in the way. 
So these are the strategies I'll be talking about today. Um, the picture here is a gentleman by the name of Alexander Soba. He crossed the Atlantic Ocean three times, three times in a solo kayak, the last one at age 70, and it took him 110 days. But Alexander Soba, you know, has this contrarian attitude about aging. And he says, um, you know, he relabels suffering as determination and motivation. It, it, it's kind of this contrarian self-determination. As he says, if you're not willing to suffer, you can do nothing. You can sit and die. I don't want to die in my sleep. Now, I'm not recommending that we kayak across the ocean, but there are so many opportunities and so many new challenges that come along, and that can be a good thing. So we have a lot to cover today. Let me go on to our next slide. I'd love to talk about the blue zones. Many of you have probably heard of the blue zones, but before I get into that, I just want to share some interesting research from the National Institute of Health. In 2016, they came up with a publication that talked about genetics and how long we live. And they found that genetics only accounts for about 30% of our longevity, 30%. And the other 70% is due to our lifestyle. And whatever goes into our current lifestyle in terms of, you know, our diet and fitness and all of these positives, which I'll touch on in just a second. But 30% due to genes and 70% due to our lifestyle. So, you know, um, we're getting away from this old stereotype, fortunately, this ageist stereotype that aging brings with it decline and helplessness and dependency. And we are shifting to a very different perspective about our senior years, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 100 plus, and how there is more opportunity, time to celebrate. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But we're shifting from this negative uh, age is stereotype to a very positive outlook about aging. So the blue zones, these are five geographic areas uh, around the world. Researchers, uh, dem demographers were looking at maps around the world that showed the uh, percentage of population that were over 100. And they identified five geographic areas around the world with the highest incidence of centenarians, the world's oldest old. And here are the five areas. There's the Greek island of Ikaria, uh, Okinawa, Japan, a region in Sardinia off the coast of Italy, Loma Linda here in Southern California, and the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. And what they found is that a lot of these centenarians have very common lifestyles, very common features that make up their, their current functioning. And it explains why from one region to another, so many of them are living well into their 100 plus years. So if there's anyone here in the audience from any of these blue zones, you should probably be uh, up here instead of me. But I'm happy to share with you what we learned uh, from the, from the uh, centenarians. Okay. These are the lifestyle traits that the researchers uncovered. Number one, the very physical, uh, the centenarians in the blue zones move their bodies a lot. They're not doing marathons, they're not going to the gym necessarily, but they're very physical. They do a lot of walking up and down stairs, walking to town, doing gardening, doing a lot of physical activity. <clears throat> Number two, there's some use of alcohol, but in moderation, not excessive and not abstinence. Excuse me. Um, probably one to two drinks a day uh, and no more than that. Number three, social engagement. That's really uh, very prevalent in the blue zones. A lot of social activity, connecting to activities, volunteering, uh, staying engaged with friends. Uh, it also includes some religious faith, but not necessarily uh, going to church regularly, but some religious uh, connection with their community. Um, Number four, which I think is the most important, having a sense of purpose, uh, passion, hobbies, interests, something that uh, allows them to wake up in the morning and look forward to their day. Here's my goals, here's my objectives for today. So it's that connection with some other activity, some other purpose that you know gives them some satisfaction. 
Number five, uh, commitment to family and friends, very important, close connection to family and close friends, especially those who support their healthy lifestyle. Number six, we hear a lot about diet, plant-based diet, fruits and vegetables, very prevalent, a lot of colorful fruits and, and vegetables, you know, squash and beans and nuts and grain. Um, there is some protein they have identified. There is, you know, the centenarians in the blue zones do uh, take in protein, but small portions, three to four ounces, and no more than four or five times a month. So um, there are other ways to, uh, three to four ounces of beef. There are other ways, of course, to get protein, but not a lot of uh, heavy use of red meat. And um, number seven is uh, sleep. Uh, at least seven hours of sleep uh, in in these centenarians. I want to say a little bit more about this sense of purpose. I talked about this in the previous slide, but something that brings meaning to our lives and are we are we really committed to something? It doesn't matter if it's part of a group or if it's something that's solo or formal or informal, but something that gives us this sense of meaning. Uh, years ago, I was lucky enough to hear a presentation by a psychologist, gerontologist by the name of Ken Dykewald, and this this goes back a few years. And back then, even even then, Ken was predicting this shift in demographics. People were living longer, and he talked about post-retirement years and the need for second careers, new vocations, new learning, new training, new opportunities, opening up new doors. And he was right, of course, and we're seeing now that as we live longer, we have these, um, I listened to Ken just uh, a month ago and he talked about um, the, the longevity bonus that we have with our longer lives. So what do we do with this bonus time? What do we, how do we make up this time? And, you know, there's so many opportunities out there, you know, online courses and learning a new language and learning, you know, taking up some musical instrument. I bought myself a, a set of drums a year ago, and I never played a musical instrument. But these are electronic drums, so nobody can hear, and I wear a headset, and nobody gets to enjoy my banging every night, but I can hear it myself with my headset. But anyway, I, I'm learning to play the drums. Very difficult, but, you know, persistent. And, um, you know, it's it's learning these new things and taxing our brain. And we know that, the, you know, the more we can um, create this cognitive stimulation, the better it is for us because it helps us in our brains to stay healthier longer. So, um, you know, things like um, uh, Oasis Learning Centers, um, uh, TED presentations, uh, Silver Planet, um, Linda, Udemy, there's a bunch of online programs. Murthy is out of the UK. So there's plenty of opportunities out there to, to really jump into these courses formal or informal. A lot of the universities now are doing online for seniors. So um, I encourage people to make sure that these extra years have some structure and some challenge and cognitive stimulation. Okay, I, uh, I'm i going to share with you a slide. I've always been impressed with this woman, Joanna Quas. Um, she took part in her first gymnastics tournament at the age of 10. She left gymnastics to get married and raise a family, and she returned to uh, professional gymnastics at the age of 56. And uh, sadly, Joanna passed away, but in her 90s, she was still performing, and she was, she was competitive as a gymnast. And I, I, I want to show you this slide. It's uh, just a couple of minutes, and it, it's a fun slide to watch.
Thank you, Carrie. Sure, let me just get it back. Okay. So her motto, Joanna's motto was, the biggest mistake you can make is when you do nothing. So I always enjoy watching this as an inspiration. All right, next slide. So this is a this is a fun story. Um, you know, we we know there are different ways to kind of identify our age. There's chronological age, which is the number of times the Earth has been around the sun since we've been on the planet. There's what's called a biological age, and this is what scientists can use by uh, different using different biomarkers in, in the body that determine how healthy or how non-healthy we are. Um, uh, there are a lot of different biomarkers that are used. So there is a biological age. And the third one is what we call a health age or psychological age or subjective age. That's how old we believe we are, how old we, we think we are. And there's a lot of research now that's talking about how that, uh, when we think we're actually we believe we're younger than our chronological age, that has a you know a very positive influence on our lifestyle and our longevity. Anyway, this is a story about a gentleman by the name of Emil Rottelbond. He was a single man living in Holland, working in television, and Emil was unhappy being 69. <laughs> he said he can't get dates on online sites. When they hear his age, they lose their interest. He felt he was discriminated against because of his age. Um, he said it affected his ability to work, to get a bank loan, to um, you know drive a nice uh, sports car and find dates and so on. So Emil went to the court to change his age. He argued that um, you know people can change their names these days. They can even change their genders. Uh, he felt he should be able to change his age. He said, when I'm 69, I'm limited. If I was 49, then I could buy a new house, drive a new car, take up more work. And this is what the, what he argued in his case. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, the Dutch court disagreed. They said we cannot change our age, but we can feel as young as we want. Um, um, they said, uh, Mr. Rottelbond, you can feel 49, but you cannot change your age because that would you know, cause us to eliminate 20 I years of records in our system. So, age is only a number. That's my point. Getting some feedback here. Okay, we have one more video here, and this is a couple of dancers in their 90s. Uh,
<clears throat> Thank you, Kerry. <clears throat> Makes you want to dance. Yeah, I love his suit and those shoes. I mean, if you're wearing that uh, outfit, that makes you want to dance. Anyway, um, hope you enjoyed that. One of my favorites. <laughs> okay, let's talk about thinking styles, thinking patterns. I think it's important how we understand what goes on in our head and how we interpret events and how we explain events that's going to really color how well we cope with these events and you know to me how we explain these events it really has a huge impact on how well we manage them and our attitude colors our coping ability this is a picture of a roman philosopher uh, his name is epictetus epictetus was a slave um, before he was freed by his master and he was a Roman slave and then he was freed and he went to school and he went to uh, um, uh, study philosophy and he was one of the founders of the school of stoicism if any of you have heard of stoicism and you know it's all about you know uh, not letting emotions cloud our thinking cloud our judgment and you know being able to think clearly and his famous line and I think this is really important we are disturbed not by events, but by the views we take of these events. So just to understand that, we we can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond to them. And let's talk about uh, a couple of thinking styles. First of all, positive or negative thinking. And we, we all hear, uh, you know, is the glass half full or half empty? And, you know, my explanation is if you've got an eight ounce glass with four ounces of water, it's half full and it's half empty. You decide. When I do this um, presentation in, in large groups in front of an audience, I divide the room into halves and the right half I say, okay, you're the optimist, put your optimism hat on and I want you to look around the room and find everything that's great and nice about the room. Maybe the fixtures, maybe the sun coming in, the plants look healthy, whatever you see that's positive. And then the other half of the room, I want you to be the, the negative thinkers. Uh, put your pessimist hat on and find everything that's wrong. And, you know, stains on the carpet, maybe marks on the wall, chairs that are broken, whatever. And then we reconvene after a minute and I get feedback. And, you know, just as I asked, we get the positives about the room and then we get the negatives about the room. And the point I try to underline is that it's the same room right it what are you looking for if you're looking for what's good you'll find it if you're looking for what's wrong you'll find it so uh, again whatever these events are and how we explain these events to us is it a you know another surgery another friend's death another broken water pipe in the house I, I don't think I can handle another one or is it another bump in the road and I think I can get over this one too so negative thinking marked by worrying, complaining, blaming, expecting the worst. Positive thinking marked by problem solving, planning, perseverance, possibility. So uh, how we explain these events really is going to color what goes on uh, afterward and, you know, how well we manage them. Number two, another thinking style is what can we control versus what we cannot control? And we spend a lot of time worrying about things that we really cannot control. And, um, you know, let me show you this next slide because it has a list of things. There we are. Things that I can control. I cannot control the weather, obviously. I can't control foreign policy. I can't control gas prices. Uh, I can't control sunset, sunrise. A lot of things are out of our control. But here's a nice picture of things we can control. Our values, our beliefs, our attitudes, what foods I eat, how often I exercise. Um, in the left-hand side, how often I ruminate on the past I have some say over that. And I would often talk to patients in nursing homes about, you know, there was a lot of time spent on ruminating over disappointments or failures or, you know, regrets, uh, feeling guilty about things. And my point was, 
we can't change those events. We can't change what happened, but we can change our perception of that event. We can change how we explain that event to ourselves. And you know, to remember, maybe, maybe at the time, it was the only thing we could do, or it was the best option we had. And if we had it to do all over, we might do it differently. But the point is, let's change the perception of that and stop worrying about something that that we did wrong. I always like to cite, cite this uh, baseball study, baseball cards. Um, some researchers looked at baseball cards and uh, they looked at 230 baseball players that started their careers before 1950. And they looked at their pic pictures, their smiles in the baseball cards, and they divided them into two groups, those with uh, nice smiles and those with without a smile. And they found that on average, the, the baseball players that smiled in their cards lived on average seven years longer. Um, so I'm not saying that smiling is gonna help us live longer, but whatever causes us to keep that smiling, you know, pleasant attitude probably is connected to our longevity. This is our next slide. It's helpful to look back over our life journeys and see a series of chapters unfolding, succession of events that mark our journey and graduation, marriage, birth of children, promotions, retirement, and death of a spouse, remarrying, whatever these chapters are. And they serve as, you know, um, opportunities to kind of evaluate our lives. And, you know, I, I'm thinking that there are always going to be new chapters ahead. We're always going to be starting new chapters, whether it's intended or not, whether it's liberating or not, maybe downsizing from our home to a smaller apartment, maybe separation or divorce giving up the car keys, uh, death of a spouse. How do I go on after losing my spouse of 50 years? I don't think I can do it. Uh, you know, the future looks so dark alone. So how do we manage this and start a new chapter? I'm not minimizing the grief and the loss and the sadness. And we go through that grief and we can move through it and look at starting a new chapter. Maybe we're now responsible for a spouse with uh, dementia or an Alzheimer's disease. I never, you know, foresaw my future with my spouse as, you know, being a caregiver, a full-time caregiver with my husband or my wife who now has Alzheimer's. So these are these are new chapters that we we start, and it's like writing a new script and whatever whatever role we need to take on, whatever character we need to take on, it's this is our script. That's that's the opportunity here. That's the benefit. We move through these changes and we open ourselves up to new opportunity. So living longer to me is all about attitude and adapting and staying positive even when things get in the way. Let me say a little bit more about this um, rewriting that script. I, you know, I like to think of our future as a, a blank screen and we can project whatever we want onto this this blank screen. You know, actors, you know, call it write a new character or role. And we think of having this blank screen to project a new role for ourselves. And I think there's inspiration to being open to a new positive future. It's this positive mindset. And we're creating a new definition of ourselves, whatever it is, whatever happened to us whatever this um, you know, marker, this milestone was, and we're creating a new role, a new character. And you know, to me, self-definition is, is a mental construction. And like any construction, we can change that. We can remodel it. I, I like to tell the story about Steve Jobs. We all know Steve Jobs was the founder of Apple. Uh, brilliant, brilliant technician, engineer, um, and you know, Steve Jobs, I read the biography of him by Walter Isaacson, great biography, but uh, Steve was adopted as an infant. And uh, he found out he was adopted uh, at around 10 or 11, and Steve was crushed. He was just demoralized. He said, how could my parents, my own biological mother, give me up? I must be you know, such a worthless person, having no value at all. My own parents didn't want me. 
Well, his adoptive parents found out about this and they corrected him and said, no, 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 Steve. When we saw you as an infant in the hospital, you were the most important person to us in the world. You were the most valuable person and we, we wanted you in our lives. We, we couldn't imagine living without you. So what happened? Steve Jobs went from being the most wor worthless person without any value to now becoming the most important person in the world. The adoptive parents didn't give him any new skills or talents. It was that shift in mindset and that, that new image that Steve created. It's almost like flipping a switch. So can you imagine if Steve Jobs never had that conversation with his adoptive parents and he went through life feeling so worthless? No Apple, right? No iMac, no iPad, no iPhone. Heck, we'd all be using uh, Blackberries and Palm Pilots and nothing against, um, you know, Hyundai and other phones, but uh, it, it, the point is, uh, we we can we can we have these, some of these conversations, conversations with ourselves and maybe kind of look at things from a new perspective and flip that switch ourselves. Okay, I'm going to move a little quicker. I'm noticing our time here. Let's see. Stepping out of our comfort zones, we've heard of comfort zones. It's that safe, familiar, comfortable, predictable place. You know, we're consistent, um, but stepping out of that comfort zone can kind of trigger new reactions from others. Maybe it triggers a little anxiety because we're, we're doing things that are we're not accustomed to. Maybe going to a different restaurant, changing our hairstyle or changing our uh, style of clothing. We're stepping out of that comfort zone. And again, the comfort zone is safe and familiar, but can we think of, you know, being in that unfamiliar place that's a little bit anxiety producing and um, it, it, we're letting the uh, new opportunities bring some excitement, bring some opportunity, bring some challenge. There's a, a book that was written by Joe Dispenza. It's called Breaking the Habit of Being Our, Yourself. And he talks all about the shifting from our usual behaviors into this unknown territory and creating new and exciting opportunities. So again, I talked about this earlier, uh, new challenges, learning new languages, taking courses, a new career, new side interests, new gig, side gigs, side hustles. Routine is safe, but the being out of that comfort zone opens us up to new opportunities. And I always like to tell a story about Michelangelo. We know he was a famous painter and sculptor. And he was admired for his statues that created, you know, he created out of blocks of marble and, and stone. He lived for 88 years and was best known for his ability to instill this sense of awe in his statues. And he was asked, how can you create such works of art out of a block of stone? And he said, you know, it's the job of every sculptor to find the statue inside that block of stone. And it's the task of the sculptor to discover it and set it free. And maybe we have some of these sides of ourself that we can get in touch with and, you know, open up to and step out of that comfort zone and get into some new areas. Uh, just quickly, I'd like to introduce you to Edith Murway. Edith started um, competitive weightlifting at age 91. <laughs> I heard a story about her on NPR last fall. At age of 98, seven years later after she started, she set a Guinness World Record for being the oldest competitive power lifter, being able to lift 150 pounds. She just turned 100. Uh, and Edith said what she enjoys the most is the applause from the audience. Now, again, I'm not encouraging people to take up powerlifting or kayaking across the ocean, but there are a lot of opportunities to enjoy. Okay, overcoming setbacks. This is a picture of Roderick Sewell. Roderick was the first double amputee to compete and complete the Ironman triathlon in 2019, a few years ago. That's a 2.4 mile swim. 112 mile bike race and he was kneeling on a hand cycle and a 26 mile marathon wearing two prostheses. 
he had his legs amputated as a child. He, uh, you know, became um, an advocate for challenged athletes and opened his own fitness studio. But I wonder how many of us could do something like that. I had a patient in a nursing home. Uh, we'll call him Ralph, and Ralph um, had advanced diabetes and you know severe vascular disorder, and he had to have his leg amputated. And Ralph was a boxer, a professional boxer, and it was very difficult, of course. It'd be difficult for anybody, but for Ralph, looking in a mirror uh, with one leg amputated was very difficult. About three months later, he had to have his second leg amputated, and very difficult, and he was referred, and I started working with Ralph, and in helping him to, you know, cope and adjust to this law, serious, heavy duty. But um, my point with Ralph was, look, your, your value as a person doesn't change based on how your body appears or how your body functions. Your value is immutable. Your your value does not change, uh, re, you know, by external events. So, and that's that's important for him. So, we, you know, we, we, we dig deep and we accomplish things we didn't think we were capable of. You know, whatever whatever requires to take that step to um, you know take on some new behavior, new attitude. You know, I, I I like to you know talk about being the captain of our ship. And you know, as I said at the outset, our body doesn't always cooperate, but you know um, we're still the captain and we're still in charge. And I have value and worth regardless of how sick or impaired my body is. Uh, let me talk just for a minute about depression. Uh, depression affects us in many ways. It affects our attitude, our mood, our appetite, um, you know, our thinking, our decision making, our activity level. And one thing that depression does very, very well is it narrows our perspective and it blocks out looking at the whole picture. And when people are depressed, all we see is what's wrong. All we see are the failures, the disappointments, the regrets, what to feel guilty about. And it's almost like we're wearing um, a filter that only lets in the bad and keeps out the good. Or, you know, blinkers, if we're wearing blinkers, you know, horses are fitted with blinkers sometimes to keep them from being distracted. Race horses are fitted with blinkers so they're not distracted during a race. But when we're wearing uh, these blinkers, it, keep, it blocks out the, the good things. So for me, overcoming Depression means looking for exceptions, helping the person spot some of those good things that actually take place because we don't see them when we're feeling down and discouraged and our vision is very, you know, narrowed. So let's look for exceptions. I had a patient at a nursing home and she was very negative, uh, extremely negative. Nobody could do anything right. The nurses, uh, the food was bad, the activities, the other residents didn't care for her. Uh, the administrator couldn't do anything right. And I, and I came in to see her one morning. I said, you know, Harriet, uh, can you tell me, is there anything that, you know, that was good for you today? Anything positive happened? And she said, well, you know, the, the man who came in to fix my air conditioning smiled and he said, good morning. He was very nice. And I thought, okay, there's the exception. If we can find one exception, we can find others. So that's my, that's my tip to, you know, if we're feeling down or discouraged, everything is wrong, nothing is going right, let's help the person see some of those strengths, some of what I call residual strengths. There's still some positives out there that we're not seeing and helping the person to, to see those positives. So I could, I could talk for a long time about successful aging and staying positive and you know what's important is how does this information that i'm sharing today apply to you in your own situation we know it's not a smooth road ahead so you know please feel free to visit my website living to 100.club a lot of resources there podcasts blogs uh, sign up for my mailing list there's a lot of information um, you, you can you know get an email announcement every week about our latest podcast anyway uh, a lot of good information there. So I'm going to wrap up here. We, we, you know, we, when I opened today, I asked you to imagine how you'd feel with a new mindset and new ways to manage the obstacles on your path. So congratulations on being so attentive. Now you have some information and hopefully you can take these tools and put it into action. We talked about a number of uh, important topics, centenarians, 
uh, what is the what are the common features of these centenarians, the world's oldest old, especially that sense of purpose? We talked about thinking patterns, positive and negative thinking. How am I interpreting events? We talked about starting new chapters, redefining ourselves like Steve Jobs, overcoming setbacks, create a positive mindset. So these are our best years. I, I, I can't stress that enough. We have the maturity, the wisdom, the compassion, the independence to stay positive, to celebrate aging, and embrace the notion of getting older. So from my perspective, to age successfully means to cope with whatever struggle comes our way. And if it means living to 100 or more, hopefully that's great. If that's not in the cards, we stay positive along the way. So we take control of our future. We commit to moving forward no matter how many bumps we encounter. Even with losses of loved ones, we look forward. Even with secure retirement and good health, we look forward. Even with bodies that don't cooperate, we look forward. Our beauty is in our spirit, our fire and our flame and our drive and our motivation and our outlook. So my final message for everyone today is that the best part about everything that I've been saying this fire, this flame, this determination, this spirit, this is ours. This is ours to keep forever, and no one can take it away from us. Not our spouse, not our adult children, not our friends and neighbors, not our doctors. This drive, this spirit, this positive outlook is ours, and it's ours to keep forever. Okay, we have time for uh, a few questions, I, I hope. Um, Carrie, you want to um, field any questions that come along? Yes, and thank you so much, Dr. Casciani. I think that you provided a lot of good information. I'm definitely taking things away from today's uh, presentation. Okay. I, When you speak about the purpose, I think that comes up for us quite a bit at Elder Health with our volunteer opportunities. And while we work with volunteers of, of all ages, um, I often find that there are those who retire and say, now what? You know, I still need to have that purpose. I want to have that purpose and um, and finding the right opportunity for, for those individuals has been um, has been part of, of what I've enjoyed at my time here at Elder Health too. But I, I applaud yeah. you for that. I gold stars to you. That's great. That's so important. <laughs> well, I, I think it's important for people to find whatever it might be. Not, you know, not everybody has the same interest and so looking at all of the different stories you shared I, I hope that that um, jogged some people's interests and memories and and uh, for moving forward as Great. well Great. Um, let me see I, I don't see any questions if anybody has any questions now is your chance you are able to type them into the question pane and I'm happy to help facilitate that so feel free to put in your questions and we will answer those And in the meantime, while we wait to see what questions come in, I think um, looking at this slide and seeing all of the different resources that Dr. Casciani offers, I definitely encourage you to check it out. I've been to his website and it's really clear and easy to find the different mm -hmm. topics and information. And um, and I think we can continue learning from him. Hey. So, Yeah, people yes. can download um, my PDF. It's called My Nine Tips for Living Well While Living Longer. That's a free download. You can go to Amazon oh, and pick up a copy of my book, Living Longer is the New Normal. That's on the slide here. Um, it's a quick read, 100 pages, but a lot of what I've talked about today and more, of course, but uh, some good information. And, you know, I, 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 I think there's just a lot of value in helping people feel inspired about their future. So. That's that's where I'm coming from. Definitely. Yeah. I appreciate that. And um, and I will, for everybody who has attended today, uh, you will receive a follow-up email from me with the recording link, as well as um, the website for the Living to 100 Club and, and any other additional information. I'll make sure to include that so that you have that as a takeaway and an easy to find location. Um, I'll wait and see if there's any questions. I'm just going to move forward, but um, until we have that. But I again just want to thank you for your time today and um, and sharing. And it looks like oh we have um, a comment and 
Let's see. It says, thank you, Dr. Casciani, for many nuggets of wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, this person is a mental health clinician case manager, and they really appreciate on focusing on the looking for exceptions and the fire and spirit mm -hmm. of the individual that nobody can take away. So I mm -hmm. think you definitely resonated with, <laughs> with the audience, which is wonderful. Thank you for thank that you comment. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Um, and uh, just a, a special thank you again to Pharma for sponsoring today's webinar. And uh, again, as I mentioned before, I will share information and how to, to reach them for additional um, resources and, and what they do to support the community. Uh, our upcoming webinar will be on Thursday, August 18th at 11 o'clock, and it will be on the topic of how to talk about memory loss. So I encourage anybody interested to register for that. It is on our website um, and the experts at Alzheimer's San Diego will be sharing their strategies and their tips for us on that. And I'll leave it up on this slide that has Elder Help's information. So you have our contact information, email and phone number. Um, if you're not yet signed up to receive all of our upcoming webinar details, you're welcome to do so by just letting me know um, by emailing me or you can respond when I send you the follow-up email and I'd be happy to add you to that list. Um, and you can check out our website at elderhelpofsandiego.org. I'm gonna see if there's any other comments or questions. It looks like we've covered them all. So I will be sure to share your information with the audience. So if they have anything else, they can surely reach out to you directly. But um, thank you again, Dr. Casciani, for taking the time today and sharing your wisdom with all of us. We appreciate that. And um, and thank you all for joining today. Yeah, you're most you're welcome, welcome, Carrie. welcome, Carrie. Thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed this a lot. And keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, take care, everybody. <laughs> Bye, all.